Hey guys, Henning and Morden from Flip Normals here. Uh, this time we are coming to you from two Scandinavian countries. Uh, so this is going to be an interesting sort of video. But we are going to be talking about the Unreal Engine 5 um, reveal. And a lot of people have given their initial thoughts on it. Sort of the hype has died down a little bit. We wanted to give it a little bit of time and actually analyze what they've been saying and what they want to do and just sort of comment it from a film perspective because that's one of the things that they also talk about and give you our thoughts and impressions on this new and exciting technology. So in this first part of the video, which was really cool, this is kind of when they started talking about the GI part of Unreal, which is something that, you know, with, with the advent of RTX and new graphics cards coming along, they, they talk about sort of like real-time path tracing. Obviously, this still isn't real-time. It's not, not path tracing. This is still faking global illumination to some extent, but it's, it's, it's amazing to see this kind of technology coming onto gaming consoles. But my God, are they faking it well. This <laughs> is probably the thing I'm the most excited about when it comes to all of this. Yeah. Like like Morton was saying, you know, our background is in film. So one of the things I'm always thinking about is not just how can this be epic in terms of uh, the, the in terms of games, but how can this be awesome in terms of filmmaking as well. Uh, Unreal is being used more and more in terms of film. It's being used a lot in previous, but also some final rendering as well. I believe that it was actually used for some final renders of Rogue One. And it's not hard to see why that is when you're looking at this this here is this here looks like it's offline rendered i actually can't tell from looking at this is this is offline rendered yeah. or this is this is real time it's absolutely insane i think they were using was it was it unreal engine 4 for the mandalorian they were using it as some kind of um like for background shots or something they were having having the set in the background while they were doing stuff i think that was with unreal 4 yeah, I think I think it is. Which is pretty cool, and like that's the technology where it's at right now. And then, you know, the, the, actually, that's one of the things that I'm most excited about is not so much what can Unreal Engine Five do for video games, because in in my opinion, in terms of graphical fidelity, if we if we take away the GI stuff, but just the pure graphical fidelity of objects, uh, the poly. Um, like how many polys are on screen at any given time. I feel like we're already at a really high level, obviously because in games it's being faked with, with normal maps, there's some displacement happening, but it's already at a really high level. So I'm more excited for the sort of film aspect of it, how it can be used, not just for previous, but what Henning is talking about for final frames as well. One of the things which is really cool about this as well is that it really speeds up iteration time, particularly like if you are looking at this from a film perspective, I mean, also in games as well. But if you if you're looking for film, what you have to do a lot if you were to do a scene like this, you would have to bring in all your assets and you would have to just render the crap out of it. And rendering like a sequence like this in low quality using something like Arnold or Renderman, you would you would you know have to wait overnight to see that and the result would probably be a little bit better you know if you were to compare like the tiny little uh, shadows the sharpness of the shadows in in the like just at the edges of things and all that it would probably be you know a little bit better you might not notice it but it would be a little better but that's not worth having one revision a day now you can just light it in real time you can really just get like it's not like 10 revisions you get unlimited revisions because you're doing it in real time you can change the lighting around you can add new lights and you can see it all happen you know without actually having to render so that's a huge part of this you just speed up your creativity significantly yeah i just want to go ahead a little bit in this video and just like just looking at the lighting here is is actually crazy you know um and what they're doing with the GI, it's, it's sort of one of the things we talked about was the whole using GI and using lighting for a from like a story point of view, where you can tell a story with just using lighting uh, alone. What we were talking about just before the video we started here was talking about, oh, maybe like a stealth game or something, how it impacts how you see the level, because no longer are levels just going to be with a little bit of light and then some shadow bounce light actually changes the frame like quite significantly yeah this is something which is going to completely change everything like lighting is lighting is an element which really hasn't been used 
that much in games. But with this, this is I'm I'm convinced this is gonna spark a whole new like almost like genre, like maybe like um like puzzle games as well. If you had to do mm. you had to you had to shine a light at a specific spot and now the, the bounce light you get back is the answer to a puzzle or something like that. Yeah, I just yeah, think yeah. this opens up a whole new world when it comes to it. Like this is what happens in film as well. Like lighting is really used as a story element, but it, it just hasn't been done the same way in games. Like I can't remember what the game was called. Um is the game developer's name is Jonathan Blow. He did like uh he did Braid first i think it was called and then like this island puzzle game oh, i forgot oh, the celeste ah uh, no not celeste i think it's it's older mm. than that um oh, okay. it was a great it was a great game it's like where you look around and you have to find these constant paths so you like draw a line between fez? them no, it's not fez that's another developer uh-huh. as well. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> anyway um it's very sort of it's it's very much sort of perspective driven and it's it's all about where you look in the level that sort of like the the environment itself becomes the puzzle that you have to connect and like you say like something like lighting could be a huge thing there where you use the bounce light off of something to complete a puzzle or something you shine a a laser on the water and that actually makes the light bounce or something you know these kinds of things obviously i mean maybe a laser is a little extreme because you could easily do that just faking that but like the bounce light in itself just can add dimensionality which i think has been really hard to do before and not just not just from like a gameplay point of view in terms of you add get new features but it just looks so much better as well Mm. when it comes to it when you have fairly decent pbr shaders which we have today when you add physically plausible lighting i suppose like this it's just going to be like a dream for cinema cinematographers i was i was reading some something uh, a game dev said like it was a few months ago that in a year two years 10 years every single game studio will have an actual cinematographer mm. somebody who works with the lighting and the shots and all of that like i'm currently going through assassin's creed odyssey and you can tell they don't have a cinematographer on that <laughs> to the same extent every single shot is, is very is very static and very still and the lighting is very flat but if if you were to compare it to the atrocity which is the assassin's creed's movie you know that has cinematography in it so the shots are really beautiful yeah it's one of those things where as as games transition more and more into becoming some of the high fidelity games transition into becoming more and more film like you know in in a in in a month from now you have the release of last of us 2 and you know one of the things that they did really well with the last of us 1 was was the cinematic storytelling in that game and you know i think that's really going to be pushed to the next level in in the sequel and then the tools that unreal gives game developers going forward i think that's going to be really interesting to see what they can do to sort of get to a more film-like level let's continue here for a little bit and um i think like like i just mentioned in the beginning this is one of the elements that i find less interesting about unreal just like having just yeah like they say an insane number of triangles in the scene at any given time right it, it's i already think the fidelity of games is super high. Obviously, it's just going to get pushed higher and higher with every new release and every iteration of a game engine that comes out. But I don't know. Personally, for me, this I'm not as excited about this as, as some of the other stuff that they showed in the demo. So yeah, I mean, I think I think it's in, I think it's I think it's really insane that you can do this. But I, I'm personally way more excited about about the GI. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, me too. <laughs> it, I mean, it's cool that you can, like, you just drag stuff in from from uh, Mega Scans. I know that Unreal they acquired um, is it is it all of Quixel? They sort of like yeah. they integrated that with Unreal, and you can use that for free if you're using Unreal. Um, do you get access to that, that library, which is amazing. And we've seen that before, you know, we've seen really cool cinematics being made, uh, with Unreal. There was that some time ago, it's kind of like this Icelandic, uh, Death Stranding inspired looking environment. I think it actually came out before Death Stranding though, where it was all like all real time, all done with mega scans. And it looked like an actual movie, um, kind of looked like, uh, oblivion with the, oh, the Tom short Cruise film. a little yeah yeah exactly yeah that looked that looked insane one of the but one of the major differences 
I think when we see those kinds of demos is that we never see any kind of interactivity. Everything is static, right? It's just static shots of static environments and nothing deforms, nothing has to move. And a lot of things are instanced, which is also something that we'll talk about in a little bit in this video, I guess, because instancing and displaying trillions of polygons on screen at, at one time is, was a big thing about this demo. This blows my mind. Yeah. Like an insane amount. The fact that you can just turn it on or off. Yeah, it's obviously this is done for show as well, where you go like, oh, here's no GI at all. And here's with our GI system, because obviously in a regular level or whatever, you would then have multiple lights, right? You would bake some lights here, you bake some lights there. So you would have something that closely resembles GI. The cool thing about this, though, is the interactivity, how it's fully interactive, right? You turn on GI, you just have GI. There's nothing that you really need to go into fake. There's nothing you need to tweak, really. It's just GI. That's what we're seeing with uh, with engines as well, like other engines as well. It, it just becomes easier and easier. Like yeah. some years ago, you had to fiddle with like final gather maps and all that <laughs> kind of stuff in rendering. And now you just kind of point the light and let let the the system do its thing. It's like back in the day when I first started using 3ds Max, right? We do like we had our own like final gather. Uh, where we like we set up like lights, 64 lights in a circle around to <laughs> sort of simulate that we had yeah. GI, even though no one had GI. It was just trying to make it look like it. That was faking it with uh, with ambient occlusion <laughs> as well. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but times. this part here, I actually think, is gonna be really interesting because it's another storytelling element that just makes everything more believable. Their their new sound system, um, how they kind of like with substance, you know, with substance, they have all the substance share stuff and where they go out, they measure real textiles and recreate them in 3D. And it seems like this is sort of a similar system where they, they, they source from real world sounds and I don't know, through unreal magic, they just make sound, sound realistic. <laughs> I'm very excited about about proper sound. It's one of these things which is almost like hard to quantify. It's like mm. trying to quantify good graphics. How important is it? But when you're watching this with proper headphones on, it's it just sounds really good. Like you're just immersing yourself in in the environment to a whole different degree. Yeah, yeah. It's sound is one of those things where I feel like sound would used to be very specialized and accessible to people who did sound mixing. And then headphones started getting better and better. And now it's something that more and more people can enjoy. The fact that this is even real time is insane. Like this here, yeah. like apart from the character and I think in terms of environment, this here looks fully film, full film quality for me. Yeah, a hundred percent. Like it's like, I, like even with, I feel like with mega scans, I couldn't even pull this off myself. No, no. <laughs> if I had, you know, with an, with an offline render engine, um, but that's actually that kind of goes back to one of the things we talked about before with uh, with with real time stuff. Nowadays, I pretty much exclusively use uh, EV and Blender for for my projects. You know, I don't I don't do any customer projects anymore. I don't do you know three D for freelance or anything. But just for my own projects where I do three D or I do a sculpt or a character or whatever, everything goes into EV and all of a sudden when you have the power of unreal as well and you're just stuck stick things in there and you get this kind of quality i really hope that kind of technology will then trickle down to 3d packages to enable that to be more like that's going to become the standard in viewports so you have more accessibility to real time when you're doing stuff in 3d if a 3d software were to enable like allow you to get this graphical fidelity that would be game over like yeah. if, if suddenly <laughs> arnold was you could do this in art with arnold or in maya or Houdini, whatever like that would be a complete and absolute game changer now in terms of particles and physics i don't really know much about it in terms of games um sometimes it looks good sometimes it doesn't so I'm sure whatever they've done with their, they call it the Niagara particle system. Awesome. Yeah, I don't know, like just like 
the bloom there, the GI there, and everything lighting wise. They've also gone for that. It's it's just a personal favorite of mine in terms of color palette, where you have these red sandy rocks, red sandy rocks with bounce light. You get this nice yellow and, and orangey light. It's just, uh, I just love that look. So they kind of won me over twice with this demo just because it was like, oh, it's perfect for me. It's almost like this here is a tech demo for mega scans and not so much for yeah. Unreal. Like if you were to if you were to have to texture hand paint all this yourself, it, this would look very very different. Mm -hmm. Or you have to sculpt every rock face. That's just not feasible at yeah. all. That that's one of those smaller things that I'm I am excited about, just because I think oftentimes in games like this is the classic, the same thing when she was going through the corridor in the beginning of the demo that's like the classic oh we have to load part of the scene so let's just make a really long corridor that takes 20 seconds for the player character to to go through and they won't notice the loading screen um and for those kinds of moments if you can do the contextual animation and it, it's more procedural where it's not exactly the same animation every single time they have to squeeze through it or whatever uh it, i think again it's just smaller things that add up to add more and more realism to games and you know then hopefully that sort of transitions over to film as well probably makes it easier to animate as well instead of having to do exact animations for yeah or uh, how to do all the different things it is just more magical unreal ai magic <laughs> yeah. yeah exactly what we just talked about right you know and and this is where you really see the difference between gi and not having gi where the um, the amount of bounce light that you actually get from a magical flashlight like this compared to if you just have a flat light oh god i love wow. this this is so cool like this is this is exactly what we're talking about when it comes to like iterations as well now you mm -hmm. you don't have to light something from scratch you can just be like well what happens if we just throw away the roof <laughs> yeah. Right. Okay. So this is probably the the point about this whole demo, uh, where everyone's been talking about it, and and we've also gotten questions about it. Oh, okay. So optimization is dead, and oh, we can just export from ZBrush, and no, that's not happening. It's cool that you can export something like this, and great, you have it in 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 Unreal, and it just runs. But just because something runs in a tech demo doesn't mean that it's going to perform the same when you have something real time or even that you need to have, you know, if you want multiple instances of something that isn't completely unique, uh, you're going to start running into issues. Yeah, when we are looking at this statue and there was something like it's like 30 million polys. I did a test yesterday, <laughs> just for fun, where I tried <laughs> a 30 million poly, tried to export that out of ZBrush. And you, you can barely export it out of ZBrush. Like I, with UVs, I legit could not export out of ZBrush. It would crash every single time. And with, with like without UVs, it was around three gigabytes per file. And that is going to be insane. Like that means that this is, is not feasible at all. Imagine if you had a few thousands of these models, which you know, you probably have for a game like this. Maybe you wouldn't have a thousand of this exact model, but you would have similar things, like all different rocks where you saw all the characters, whatever. Like you would be mm -hmm. talking terabytes of data. The game games are already getting huge, like the new modern the new Call of Duty is, is over a hundred gigabytes. So space Whoa, is, is actually it over 100 a hundred gigs? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's it's what? it's actually quite a bit more than that as well. <laughs> and like a normal game today is is you know like 50, 60 gigabytes. Yeah. It's to the point that you actually need to get like a proper like you need to double the hard drive space or the SSD drive space <laughs> on your computer. If you you know if you were to <sighs> to make this run on like a PlayStation Five, whatever it is, like you you actually couldn't just in terms of of the space required for the models. And that's of course just just the pure models. Then. That would only be for the model library. You have everything else as well. Maybe the new sound system they're doing as well. Maybe the files there take up more space as well. I obviously, I have no idea. But we really should not underestimate the amount of space required for this. No, so when they say no normal maps, no authored LODs, okay, they haven't used it for this. That doesn't mean that that won't be needed for the projects that will be made with Unreal 5. Just so you yeah, know. Yeah, we... 
one of the core things I want you to take away from this video is that we are currently watching a tech demo. It's an amazing tech demo, but we're not watching a segment of a game. This is a this is an, a tech demo made to just look insanely impressive, and it is. Mm -hmm. But you cannot make a full ten hour game like this. Imagine making the like Uncharted or God of War with this. Like it is. <laughs> It's physically impossible to do this at this moment with this, you know, due, just due to space constraints. <laughs> it's like, it's like, you know, in the past, I remember with like Final Fantasy, you would have multiple discs that you would need to play in order to play Final Fantasy. In the future, you'll need multiple PS5s to play it. <laughs> so you'll just have them lined up. Yeah, per, per five minutes. <laughs> So as impressive as it is, just remember that there's a reason we have the workflows that we do. We've seen this kind of technology before, um, especially when it comes to instancing. Instancing is one of those things where, you know, you take a model, you duplicate the same model, it's connected to the same nodes. So you save a lot in memory that way. Uh, 3D software has been able to do it for, for ages. I remember like this old, old, maybe it was 10 years ago, there was like this game engine kind of thing, I think from Australia or something. World engine, world, world something, I can't remember. And they were, they, were, they were spouting this thing about like 100 billion polygons. And like the only thing they ever showed was the same palm tree. The same palm tree just being instanced to infinity. Um, you can never do anything with it. It didn't really run anything else except for the trees because it was the same tree. Um, and especially when you then factor in the lack of leds and no normal maps nothing to fake it is pure polygons from zbrush what henning alluded to before was that well it's a struggle even getting it out of zbrush and that's not on a hobbyist computer no no that's a high spec computer that's meant for that kind of work yeah this is uh, you you cannot run this <laughs> uh, i've been using similar like something kind of similar to this in moto for around a decade now it's called replicators and it's the coolest thing you know just load up a sphere and you load up a teapot and you instance the, the the teapot like a billion times around it and you're just testing it out like how what's the polygon and you get up in like the, the, the trillions of polygons but that's with one model it's there is a huge difference between having one model 10,000 times and having 10,000 models once like it's a completely different equation yeah so you, you just can't you just can't do it like that i mean you know it's still impressive but it does also come with limitations and the way they present it because it's a tech demo make it seem like that it's it's not going to be an issue one area as well is uh, how well does it deform because we mm. are not seeing the formable geo. We've seen some rigid bodies, which are by definition rigid. They aren't deforming. So if you were to have a character, how would a 20 million poly character deform? My guess is it wouldn't at all. You know, and I mean, this is the one of the parts here is that this is definitely impressive. You know, I don't want to take yeah. away from any of that. But we also just got to have realistic expectations. The cool thing here is this kind of technology will be running like they say on the playstation 5 and with the playstation 5 i think one of the things that they were talking about was re like just removing load screens altogether have everything just be there you know maybe obviously there's advances in technology uh, but definitely also software that just keeps getting more and more optimized and so i'm really excited to see this like how it actually runs on a console and what it means for for video games but for, for something like film um you know that's where we come from that's kind of what we've been doing where i see it heading is more in kind of what we talked about with the mandalorian in the beginning that's the kind of shots that yeah. they'll be using it for especially you know we saw that when did avatar come out 10 years ago yeah well, 11 <laughs> <Jeez>. years ago <laughs> and already back then right it was it was also being used to to a much uh like much much less and less fidelity than there is now but like they were using it for avatar to sort of like let the directors and and, and the camera crew see what's happening in the scene and if you can up the quality of that which they are doing now to make it look closer and closer to final frame and there'll be less guesswork shots will they will just look better because everyone knows exactly what's going to be happening in that frame 
I would be very curious to see a tech demo like this as well, but where we're not talking about you know these insanely impressive statues which are rigid, but imagine this was a live army. Mm. If you know there were actual humans here and it was they were you weren't inside like a temple like this, but you had like an outdoor environment. Yeah. Like something like, you know, Breath of the Wild where you know obviously just realistic, where you, you have foliage, you have deforming areas, you know, there's wind effects which are deforming like everything there and, and all that. I'm I'm sure that would look very different because mm-hmm. then you're dealing with a whole different set of variables. The moment something deforms, it's a completely different ball game. Yeah. Also, exactly what Henning just talked about here. But <laughs> obviously, nothing moves at this point either. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, this is like nice for like the Gerudo Desert in Zelda. Yeah, but like yeah, yeah. Not for, not for uh, like a proper deforming jungle. And this is where they're just showing off. Come <laughs> on, guys. They're like, okay, okay, like, we get my it. My jaw actually dropped when I was, I was watching this. This yeah. is absolutely insane. This and, looks you know, like full on film quality, and I can't tell it's not. No. They've, they've done a phenomenal job there. And like we mentioned before, we don't want you to ignore that fact just because we're talking about some of this technology behind it. It's still ridiculous. Like what they've been able to achieve and it's running on the next gen um, PlayStation. That's just even more impressive. So, yeah, absolutely crazy. And I'm really excited about the 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 way this space is headed i mean for me games is definitely it's definitely the more exciting um sort of territory to move into just because so many advancements seem to happen in games and have for the last five or ten years the the effects has been kind of dormant and sometimes they sort of like they just take a little bit from games here and there and then they implement it but games is just running away with it yeah, if you look at like my preferred engine, which is Arnold, Arnold is phenomenal, but you're, you're not getting the iteration times you're talking about here, no. like nowhere near. But where that is good, though, is if you want if you want to be able to do absolutely everything. Like here, you might be talking about, okay, we, we want a lot of cool static environments and not a lot of characters. Then it's absolutely brilliant. But if you're talking about uh, an environment where you need to, like a production environment where you need to be able to do absolutely everything. One day you're doing the most insane character you've ever done where you literally can't tell that it's a, that it's, it is a CD human. And next day you're doing this kind of environment, then it makes sense to keep using engines like that. Mm-hmm. But if you're doing like particularly like previous, you would not render anything there. That would be insane. Or if you if there is a way to bridge the two pipelines, where maybe you can render the environment with with Unreal and you could render the full on characters with you know the proper ray trace subsurface scattering shaders, which you just need in order to get the real, realism there. You, you can, where you do the full on dynamics for the hair and the cloth, which you properly interacts. All the, maybe the fancy Houdini effects, all that, but. If there were, yeah, if there was a way to bridge those two, you would yeah. be absolutely unstoppable as a production house. And one thing that I think is interesting about this demo is we see the character's face like twice, once, yeah, something like that. I don't know. Um, and for me, like it looks good, but you know, it doesn't it doesn't hold up to the same standard as as they do with the environment. Obviously, the environment, the particle effects, the GI is the focus of this. I would be really curious to see a character focused demo where they do, uh, you know, mocap, they have facts in there for the faces, they do, they really push it for sort of like a film pipeline to see how realistic or how much can we push this technology for characters. Because obviously, obviously, when you're playing games, most of the time you just look at the characters, the back of the head, and, you know, that that's it. You don't really see a lot of facial performance always. Uh, the the focus is on the environment but characters are still a big part of this and especially for film so transitioning into the film realm characters is going to be massively important for that as well yeah looking at this when i first started watching it one of the first shots is of the character and i was like well, that, this is a bit underwhelming because yeah. it's it's like oh this is just a completely new next gen thing and the character just looks it looks fine but very very much looks like a game character yeah and 
that's also because you you it's really hard to get to those last last places yeah. there you are talking you have to kind of rethink deformation and simulation and shading as well it's a lot easier to shade like a metal trash bin than it is to shade like a character it's <laughs> it's a whole different area of it yeah but i'm i'm extremely impressed by by this and i don't think i think this is a huge leap forward and you're just going to see people flock to to Unreal. I mean, I'm sure as hell going to be actually looking into Unreal as well once this drops in like in next year so at some point. 2021 is the release date for it. Yeah. So uh, this is definitely on my list to to learn. But I, I don't think I would be using it much for, you know, really optimizing things and making game levels. I would be probably almost like replacing like a 3d software with it and mm. and kind of using it more as a traditional 3d software just with the insane powers of this like what you're talking about i'm working you're using ev instead of like the offline renderers yeah 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 no I, I see it being exactly the same um i would be really curious to take some projects and and throw them into unreal and actually see how that performs uh, not that i do many environments it's mostly characters but it's still pretty interesting yeah. So I mean, one like we said before, one of the key takeaways to take to from this is that this is a tech demo. Super impressive, but we're not looking at a game. No. There is no way to do a game like this at the moment. There's going to be some significant improvements in terms of just storage space in order to get that and internet speeds and everything. Imagine if you had to download a 900 gigabyte game. Like that is, <laughs> 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 it's just not possible. I think we're very one, impressive tech. One aspect where I just want to mention on with the instancing, instancing where I think it is super useful, like having a terracotta army. Sure. Okay. That's cool. But having like, let's say you make 10 different rocks that are super high quality made with mega scans and each side of the rock is completely unique, right? You can then use those 10 rocks just rotate them and, and instance them, instance them. Wow. That is a hard word to say. Instance them across the, you know, your, your world and you'll have a lot better performance because they're instance, right? So that's definitely a use case for it that I think could, um, I'm, I'm sure they've done that here in the demo as well. So maybe even like for like hair or stuff like that, mm. for like dirt. I know that just for Pacific Rim for the kaijus we made where in look dev, they would just instance stuff on top of it just to, you know, hide my crappy textures. <laughs> it was just like adding, like it was like you have a lot of polygons together, like almost like a, you have like a cube which has just been would scattered around and now you're just scattering it based on certain maps and now you have kind of pretty realistic looking dirt which is not it's not the place it displaces actual geometry yeah you could even use it to create like uh, like peach fuzz hair and all that kind of stuff because they have one hair and just instancing it mm. and you can use you can use like vector maps to, to you know to drive where the directions of of these uh, of these particles so there is a lot of really cool use cases for this as well for sure yeah yeah i mean i think that just about wraps up everything we have to say about the demo i just want more i want more demos now i want to see what else they can do and i, d I particularly want to see some character focused stuff not yeah. just the environment uh but that's just personal preference for me you know i'm more of a character person but definitely impressive what they've been uh, able to achieve with this and uh, yeah i don't i don't really have anything else to add how about you any you will you will see more Unreal training from us. Well, not us personally right now, but we have a lot of projects in the works yeah. who for who will we get exclusive moments tutorials on environments and different kinds of Unreal projects. So we're very excited about that, and we can't wait to see more from Unreal in general. Mm. So if you you like this video and you want to see more, you know, make sure to drop a comment below as to what more you want to see and like and subscribe and also turn on notifications as well. All right. See you guys later.